object relational mapping. This just means that we map SQL objects, which are relational, and you have you know, foreign keys and primary keys to actual objects and code. So that way we can more easily both uh, read and view, respond in objects, and also manipulate them. So that way you can set properties and say like save changes instead of needing to think about, okay, how do I do an update statement in SQL Server? Oh, this is a Postgres table. How do I do an update statement in Postgres? Aurum abstracts all of that. It's really nice, um, but I don't think they're perfect. And here we just have a little bit of a sample of here's what a user demo table would look like, and here's what the ORM entity framework would let us operate on. So this isn't all the like boilerplate code, but this is the object that you would actually use when you're interacting with the database. Uh, and so, yeah, they make it really easy to read, document, and actually talk about our database objects. That's where ORMs are like the shining beacon in the sky. Um, I don't think anyone's going to fault them for this. Uh, it's so much better to actually deal with these objects. We can make link queries on top of them instead of having to do uh, nitty gritty SQL queries. Like I had to look up the, the like statement. I didn't know if it was the same in uh, MS SQL and Postgres, and they seem to be the same thing. I'm sure you guys can tell me how I'm wrong and that they're not actually the same query, but we'll, we'll leave that as an exercise for the reader uh, in the later arguments. Um, so this is actually a live query from one of our systems uh, that I work at at my job. Uh, they, <laughs> you can see that that's not exactly the most readable thing in the world. Uh, if we have an ORM object, we can actually just operate on top of the object instead of needing to see all of the SQL. So that's from one route endpoint. So at an API at work, generates all of those statements. Uh, it was difficult to get them into a screenshot, so uh, you, you'll have to forgive me for how small it is. Um, another thing that ORMs really protect you against is SQL injection. Uh, that, that's a big problem uh, for any someone who's developed an external API. You need to clean your inputs, you need to sanitize, and you need to parameterize everything. ORMs just kind of do that, as long as you're making sure you're following their uh, the flavor of the month or the the how the ORM wants you to do that. And they all vary uh, differently. But in any framework, I actually uh, will be posting a list of resources I use to kind of go over this talk. Uh, and any framework is one of the better ones. You can do cleaned inputs. Uh, and you can even do raw parameterized queries. So uh, if you do have to dip down into the raw SQL, whether you need to tell your query planner, like, hey, query planner, don't use this index or don't use this. I want you to do this. Uh, you can do that in any framework, which is a key mark a very good ORM. Bad ORMs do not let you do uh, raw SQL, and that's a that's a problem. Also, as I was building the stock and, and doing some code samples, I noticed uh, IntelliSense is the best. Like Python doesn't have anything on IntelliSense, so you guys definitely did something right uh, <laughs> by picking C# -sharp as your career language, uh, so you can always have this beautiful autocomplete. Like sometimes I just hit dot, and I don't even know what I'm looking for, and I just kind of see them all, and I, I remember, oh yeah, I'm trying to do X Y Z. Uh, so that was really good. Uh, another thing is the type safety. Uh, this provides twofold things. Uh, it's really for the documentation, uh, as well as for making it easier for your juniors, your mid-levels, and even senior developers. Because seniors, you have like your hands in every single thing, uh, and it's difficult to know what you need to be working on at the same time. Um, so here's the ugly, and I kind of alluded to this at one of my earlier comments, uh, is that the code first, uh, is, is something that a lot of people like. Uh, here's my first hot take. Code first is not the way to go. Uh, and the big reason is because no nothing else integrates to it. And you might say, well, Joel, integrating to a code first database is an anti-pattern. You should have something sending that out to a data lake or something like that. And you're right. You shouldn't be directly reading and writing to a database that you've built in any other application. You should always be having data pipelines to move that data to another spot where a new owner can operate on that data. That's a good pattern. The, the rub is, is that the world is not perfect. That we all work at companies with many teams, and sometimes you need to just connect to the database to get your job done. Uh, code first databases give you huge dangers in your migration strategies, because if I need to migrate data that takes more than a few milliseconds, I need to ensure that I can do that without downtiming my production environment. And if I have to downtime my production environment in order to migrate code, all database changes are going to be very fragile. We don't want that. There's a good article that talks about doing zero downtime database deployments that I'll send to you all. Uh, I definitely recommend that, whether or not you agree or disagree with me. Uh, and I would really love if someone who wants to fight for code first could jump into Twitch chat, because I, I think these are great. Um, 
The other thing is that query planners still run the world at your database level. Uh, so that, I don't know if anyone's run into this before, but if you've built a lot of indexes on a database and you have a query with many clauses, you'll run into a fact where sometimes your query will use the indexes and sometimes it'll do a sequential scan. And you may actually want the sequential scan. If you've already done something, uh, let's say you have a gist index or a gen index, something that is not a simple text string, uh, that it can't be just a B tree where you can do like a, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, binary search. So you can't necessarily binary search on it. You need to have multiple passes over an index. A sequential scan might be faster because you might be able to do it in one single pass of the database table. Obviously this falls apart if you have billions of rows, but if you have billions of rows, you shouldn't be listening to me talk anyway. You probably should be listening to someone smarter than me. But uh, for millions of rows tables, sequential scans can actually be faster than many index lookups if those index lookups have to be done uh, repeatedly. The other problem I find is that they tightly couple a lot of our application logic to the stored data. Um, this isn't great because now, again, to your migration strategies, if you need to migrate from database A or from uh, table A to table B, you now have to change the code in the database at the same time. You can't create the new data, migrate the data without the code knowing about it yet, then ensure a code over where your code now knows about it, knows about both objects, and then you deprecate one, and now you're only on the single table, right? So this is the kind of the like a four pass approach that the article discusses for zero downtime databases. Uh, and when you're using ORMs, it's a little bit touch and go, because if you ever change the type of a column, if you ever change the name of a column, uh, especially if you ever change a foreign key or a constraint relationship, it gets very tricky. Um, and then also some ORMs, again, not most, but some, I've seen this a lot in the JavaScript world. If you guys are looking at some of the ORMs, they make it really hard to dip down to raw SQL. Uh, and you might say, well, the whole point of an ORM is so I don't have to write SQL. But again, this is the real world. The real world is messy. A lot of times, and in fact, every place I've ever worked has always had a use case for, okay, let's dip down into the raw SQL. Let's maybe Entity Framework doesn't support this type of index lookup. Maybe we need to do something really dirty and treat strings as JSON. And then we need to operate on that JSON. And so we can't do that directly in the ORM. Maybe we have some stored procedures that we don't want our ORM to know about. There's lots of things like that that feel a little dirty, but we still have to do them. Um, and so this is a little example of how to actually do a raw SQL and entity framework. One thing that's important to note, you'll see this app P1 in the screenshot. That's a parameterized query, which is awesome. I will say most ORMs don't do this. So mad props to entity framework for having parameterized queries in raw SQL. Um, all right, this is my favorite story uh, that I get to share with you all. This is about Prisma, which is a uh, TypeScript and JavaScript GraphQL ORM. Uh, really powerful, a lot of smart people built Prisma. I have a bone to pick with Prisma, and here's why. Uh, so I have several things in this slide. Uh, just to break it down a little bit, the, the key problem was is we had a, an insert statement that needed to insert a float. So we had a float, double precision in our database we needed to insert a value to that. And it worked great if it was this 1.234 number, but if you sent one, like 1.0, 1 something fell apart. And there, there's really two big reasons for that. And that's because there's a Rust processor in Prisma that is actually talking to the database, not the JavaScript layer that you're interacting with. And part of this is because people are smarter than me and they built this really advanced system to do byte streams of queries and actually operate on the bytes at the database level. And all the rest code handles this. The problem was in this one. JavaScript doesn't know what 1.0 is. It just sends one, right? There's no such thing as a decimal or integer in JavaScript. It's just a number. And so when that number was sent to Rust, Rust has a difference between an integer and a decimal. It read that one and said, ah, you're trying to set an integer value. So the part of the Rust code that received the value and the part of the Rust code that talked to the actual database didn't communicate on this. So Rust receives a one, says, ah, I will encode this as a binary integer, sends it to the database code. The database code says, I need to prepare an insert statement with this parameterized value into this column of this name. Well, that column's a double, and that binary value it's about to send is an integer. So you see this little sign bit exponent in Mantisa. This is how floating and doubles are represented in code. Uh, this means it was sending the smallest 
non-zero positive integer to our database, which is about 4.9 times 10 to the minus 324. You could see how this might be a problem if we go to read that value where we thought we had just saved one, and now we have some number that is so close to zero, most libraries will treat this as zero. In fact, Python will give you a, a divide by zero exception if you have this in the denominator of your uh, divisor. So don't do this. Um, this is a huge problem. Uh, Prisma, I think, has fixed this now in their version. Uh, thankfully, we at work have migrated away from it. So uh, no longer our issue to deal with. But this was a huge nightmare in our production system because who thinks to check if their ORM is actually sending values to the database right? I never thought to check that. And this is what really burned me uh, from ORMs. Here's one for all of the Entity Framework and C-sharp guys. Uh, I actually don't know the answer to this question, so I would love it if you could tell me. Uh, this is a way to do a direct join. So that way, let's say maybe these weren't foreign key relationships the Entity Framework knew about, so you couldn't just say dot .include. Uh, and this is a really nice syntax. And when I worked in C-sharp in 2016, they didn't have this uh, as beautiful of a link syntax. I felt like I had to do it with unions and, and withins, and that one wasn't as pretty. I didn't enjoy that. Um, so here is what we're doing is we're joining up authors, author biographies, and books. Uh, and then we create essentially a big list that has all of that information. And you can see in that second uh, link expression, we actually are grabbing all of the different things. The problem here is what happens, let's say an author has an awards. And after this, I do a dot .include awards. And that is a foreign key relationship. What will that actually do to our database? Will it do a third join under the hood? Will it do a subquery to fetch all of that, where we have an n plus one number of results and number of queries as we iterate through our authors? We don't actually know until we try it and run the SQL. So this is where I think, unless you know what you're doing, an ORM can really hide a lot of this. If you're just typing over these database objects and you think they're objects in code, there's actually a lot of work that database is having to do by fetching by foreign key, uh, deciding whether or not to do a subquery or a join. Uh, in fact, I believe Entity Framework always tries to do subqueries. My main point is that because the ORM makes it so easy to operate on objects, you don't necessarily know what those objects, what the database and ORM had to do to give you those objects in code, which can be good and bad. The bad can be the performance trade-offs. The good can be, this is really easy code to look at. Uh, for me to write out a database inner join uh, and do all of that, is fine, it would look very similar to this, but now I don't have the ability to say, oh, I wanna include their awards or their their favorites or their prices, right? Because right here, I don't have a price for any of these books. I just have book titles. I don't have a year it was written. I don't have any other metadata. Uh, and so it, it makes it easy to expand your queries in Entity Framework, but it does make it a little scarier because you can do a, a dot include or a, a, a dot, um, property name, and all of a sudden your query execution goes to poop. So uh, you you don't want that. So, but thank you guys for having me. I know I burned through that really quick, mostly just because I uh, wanted to get to the discussion parts. Uh, I want to see if there's anything I can learn about C Sharp. I did like writing it. Um, it was cool, a little bit more object oriented than I remember. Like, it's very hard to have a pure function. Like, you almost always have to have a service class to have your functions inside. So kind of hurt me as the resident functional guy. But yeah, um, Fletch, do you have anything off the top of your head that you want to talk about? Oh, yeah, let's hear it. I want to get into it. <laughs> I, um, in, you know, sometimes whenever you're at, at a conference or something like that, and then someone raises their hand to the audience and they're like, hey, I've got this question and whatever. Um, then no one no one in the audience or no one on the stream or whatever can hear the person asking the question um, and it's usually good to repeat back the question that shouldn't matter here except i was i was muted for the stream but not muted for you so you heard me perfectly fine. <laughs> and no one on the stream heard my question i'm just gonna, I'm just gonna summarize in like as few words as possible i was just saying can you that, guys hear uh, fletch now <laughs> yeah they should be able to hear me now i unmuted okay it. Uh, um uh, so I'm a code first person because in a microservice where it's a bounded context, only I access that data or that schema um, of the data. Uh, that, that's what I'm used to. And so that's what Joel's response was to, um, as I mentioned that.
even though you have a database, I've seen a lot of times you have a microservice and it does something really well. And so you start getting downstream dependencies and someone says, you know what? I don't want to hook up my BI tool to some like Kafka or Redis cache. I want to hook up my BI tool to the database. And now all of a sudden you have a BI tool scraping your database and it gets really scary. Like if you ever need to roll a breaking change, you have to roll your service, your database and any BI tools at the same time. Otherwise you'll have a schema break and things start to fall apart. So that to me has always been the most like uh, anxiety inducing parts of code first is anytime something does need to break and something always will. That's the problem. Of course, I, I, given that in the real world there's monoliths out there and they're they're not quite do following those patterns and some people don't want to follow microservice patterns but but yeah I, I can give in that not ever I think I think I actually agree with you that most places I start with I I recommend starting with database first for sure and then if they end up wanting to transition some things to microservices then then uh, then I'll, I'll tell them how to do code first to accomplish that pattern of doing things. Yeah, so. definitely. It, it seems a lot overkill when you have like a, a nice bounded context and a nice problem where you're like, okay, I just need a, a database cache. I need a service and I need some way to interact with that service. Why do I have like three different sets of code for the effectively the same thing, right? Uh, a lot of stuff in Entity Framework with MVC and with Web API makes it so easy to just say, oh, here's all my models, expose them, uh, you know, in some auth layer to, to broker it. But no, I hear you. Yeah, I've never done this pattern, but um, I've I've always considered a possibility of it. It, it breaks the idea of bounded context for a microservice. But um, I, either way, I, I usually separate my ORM into its own layer or tier. Um, and even its own NuGet package sometimes. Oh, wow. And in that sense, if, if that is separated and some other project needs to hit the database, they can still go through the rules of my ROM by the ORM by pulling that that uh, data project in as a NuGet package. I, I'm t completely against that. I would never suggest that for anyone. Um, but given what you're saying, if we had that scenario where we don't want to have to go through your API and your domain and your and then your data layer because that's just overkill and we just want to get to the data. Mm -hmm. And if you are still in a monolith and you haven't quite moved about in context, you know, there's this middle ground. I might be like, okay, fine, pull the data NuGet package. Um, yeah. But if we are in a uh, nice tight da data uh, amount of context, I'd be like, never do that. Yeah, I hear you for sure. We actually do something similar to that at work where we have, uh, so it's all Python code, but we have like all of our logic for interacting with the database and that is uh, effectively a module and it's shared with the Kubernetes workers that do things like hard math, um, report generation, prepping for downstream data pipelines, all of that. So that way each fetch this model kind of code can be common. And so if we need to make a critical update uh, it's not too bad, and that way, it, 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 all of our little little Python submodules, uh, it all talks nicely. So it, a little bit more dry, uh, so we don't mess up for some of these model buildings, right? Because you do have to grab data from many database tables. Um, but but yeah, ooh, I have another question for the group or for you. Normalization, how important is normalization, and do you normalize your database or do you not normalize your database? Hmm. I wonder if anyone else has any response to that. Um, I've never, I've never gone at a problem and said we need to watch our level of normalization. Uh, <laughs> Howard says, "Not my monkey, not my circus." <laughs> I like that. Uh, but um, there, there are a couple of rules similar to that that I follow, like like not storing calculated fields in a database. And um, if you if you do have some really weird relationships that don't have to be relational, I guess I guess. Um, flattening them out could be could make sense. Um, Howard, yeah, Howard, I, I agree with Howard. Uh, he's a C sharp developer, not a de not a database admin. So, um, which is a, another reason why we like code first, right? Because we don't want to worry about that stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts sure. on normalization, though? Um, so normalization is great at the database level. You minimize how much data you have to keep around. But then you create these things where, like, in order to get anything useful, you now have like a seven way join. And now you're like, as a developer, you're like, great, I can make these sub functions, but it's still a seven way join that I have to think about every time. And so if you ever find yourself where you never interact with a single table, 
you've done something wrong because though you might be doing an optimal data like approach like from the data storage disk space is cheap so buy more disk space and keep things denormalized when you can because that's how you're going to interact with the data now there's some exceptions to this like especially around like hipaa or financial records you don't want to create you don't want to bloat that in other places you probably want that even in like its own microservice so you could hydrate that as a, if a message needed it um, but it's really nice to have denormalized data when you're actually working in what i feel like is the real world granted a lot of my experiences at startups where if you don't ship the company goes under uh, and we don't want that uh, so you got to ship quickly. So it's a lot better to have the same model the UI uses, the same model the BI tool uses right there on the database table. So that way I can just load records and send them on. Uh, it makes it easy to document, easy to understand. When a new developer comes onto the project, whether they were a UI dev, a backend dev, a DBA, they should be able to look at the code and understand what it does. So in my opinion, denormalization is better than normalization because it's simpler. Yeah, I can see that. That makes sense. Um, there's, there's also, there's a line to be drawn because I, I definitely, well, there, there's a lot of things people skip because they'll, they'll be like, okay, we're code first. Um, <laughs> Kimberly, first of all, wants to fight you um, I, or fight anyone on, on her opinions as, as she is po possibly halfway joking because she says things like database first. She's into database first and some people are. And I, <laughs> I want to sort of get a, a whole group of people. That should be a panel. We should have a panel uh, of people who like code first versus database first. Uh, but uh, the, the idea that, that I've come across a few times is you'll have a C-sharp developer who is a C-sharp developer and they're writing code first at C-sharp and everything. But then that, that's just sort of the end of it. And you don't have a DBA looking at your migration files um, or a DBA looking at your SQL generation. So whenever you write a link statement, you can actually pull out the SQL generation um, by uh, just putting dot .query, the, whatever the, the iQueryable is, dot .query, it'll give you a string back on how it's going to generate that. And I yep. think that, that it should be common that a developer takes that and gives it to a DBA and says, this is a query that, I've, that I'm going to be using. If it were easier, you just say, I've checked in code, here's my link statement, have a DBA look at it. But DBAs don't know what link statements are going to do, especially complex ones. So, yeah. uh, Ooh, I actually have a, there was a product out there. I don't know if it's still out there. It helped me a lot when I was writing C Sharp. It's called LinkPad. Uh, and it's actually just like a, think of it like a little SQL tool, uh, but it gives you a link with IntelliSense autocomplete so that you can write little link queries and just execute them like raw SQL queries. Um, but that was really helpful in me breaking down more of the complex, like many foreign key relationships and trying to understand like when is include better when is like actually doing the uh, dot join is basically include with more steps, uh, but when you're actually expanding the properties. So like if you wanted to see like a, an author in their books, you could either say like for author and authors for book and author dot books. Um, but then that's going to create this like nested uh, select where every time you come to an author entity framework is going to go and say, oh, I need to get their books and it's going to load them rather than doing like an included or a join table where it says, I'm going to fetch up all of the authors and books. And then you iterate over that row, uh, that big row. So that's the other thing of like joins or subqueries. I don't know if anyone has talked about that, but that's I where I say, I think joins are way better than subqueries when you're looking at one thing. Subqueries are way more flexible and they make it way more composable. So that's where like all of our permission code at work is done in subqueries. That is not database performant. And in fact, our effectively DBA, he always yells at us for doing this. But because we can unit test, integration test, and actually think about our permission enforcement there, it helps us so much instead of having to always say, OK, well, what were those called in this joined up table? Will we join up all of the user groups and permissions? Um, we don't want to think about that. We just make sure we have, have every query wrapped in a permission context, which does the necessary subqueries. So really enjoy them there. But joins, so much more efficient on the database. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kimberly is going to, Kimberly wants to fight you because she did she did a YouTube video on normalization. Uh, but Jeff French, uh, one of our other uh, favorite people here, um, he, he says, <laughs> don't normalize, don't, don't not normalize, don't over normalize and don't normalize prematurely. Um, yeah, of course, there's definitely a line somewhere. I, I wonder where that line is for each person, but 
But yeah, don't ever say one way is right and one way is not wrong. You know, that's definitely a way to get uh, canceled on, <laughs> on Twitch or YouTube or whatever. Yeah, for sure. No, that's pretty much what this whole talk was is ORMs are bad. And then it's like, well, no, they're really not. So pretty much the whole time I've been walking that back because actually ORMs are one of the better tools out there. They just are not perfect. Uh, and then the leaky abstraction, by the way, shout out to Joel uh, Spolsky created Stack Overflow, uh, and his blog is still surprisingly relevant uh, in the year 2021, even though it was written between like 98 and 2002. Um, he talks about this leaky abstraction problem, and that's exactly what happens here, is when you start using the ORM in production critical code, there are going to be little parts that you can't fully know, and so that's where you will see problems. And unfortunately, none of us are going to be smart enough to tell you every single place you'll ever see an abstraction leak. But that's why we're all developers. We get to look up these error codes and we get to fight through these little niches when all of our tooling doesn't quite cover the business use case. Yeah. Um, someone someone in uh, chat, Matt Hatter Tech, brought up uh, Dapper.net, Dapper, uh, AKA Dapper. Um, I wonder what uh, what your thoughts are on Dapper, because some people say Dapper's an ORM, and some people say Dapper's just a wrapper around SQL connection, and there's some back and forth. Um, it does work with generics, so uh, do you consider Dapper an ORM based on the, the stuff that you said today, or where do you where how, where does Dapper land for you? Um, it sounds like so. I don't know the full history of Dapper. I, I've seen it before, but I have never used it. So I'm going to talk a little off the cuff. I think it's like an ORM ish. Uh, it's kind of like the Connects.js query builder where it's going to prepare statements for you. It's going to make it easier to map these statements to models, but it's not actually going to, you would, I don't think in Dapper you say like dot save changes, right? You actually tell it a query and you tell it to do it. So if you're inserting or updating, you have to actually build out a query language that says like update this part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no dot save change. It yeah. doesn't, it doesn't hold the context. Yeah, to me, that's the big difference. If it's an ORM or a query builder, um, it, if you have to say dot save changes, it's an ORM. If you say commit or you like just send it a query, then it's like a it's a query builder, right? It's just making it easier to operate on the SQL statements, which is honestly really awesome for code because now you can build composed functions where you can actually operate on subsets of the query, right? So part of your Dapper logic could be, hey, here's the object that I want to select from. And then the other part could be, here's how we do permissions filtering. Uh, so that, that that's how we use uh, SQL Alchemy, which is one of our the Python ORMs. Yeah, cool. I get really pedantic with, uh, with terminology because, especially since C Sharp uses generics so well and everything uses generics, um, it's... It is an object relational mapper. It's taking you know the the DB sets and the the junk that's coming raw and it's mapping it into an object. It is an ORM, but I also agree, Dapper. I wouldn't consider that an ORM because an ORM should have more than just the O R and M portion of of an ORM. So yeah. I agree, it's not an ORM. Isn't there a uh, like the dynamic class? You could say it's an ORM because you can give it like an arbitrary object and it just does like a JSON parse on it. So like in theory, that whole class is an ORM, but not really because it's just yeah. that. <laughs> uh, so that, I don't think that counts. But no, I think that's a good distinction. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I have not heard of AutoMapper. Is it similar to Dapper? Um, I, I, unless I'm mis misreading that, but I think AutoMapper is like a DTO. Uh, framework, so it, it, you'll, you can take two different classes and sort of map them between each other. Um, unless Jeff says there's a an implementation of AutoMapper that works with data data sets, DB sets, or uh, 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 SQL connections or something like that. I'm not sure, but um, but yeah, it, it it maps from one object to another, so it's like an object mapper. It's <laughs> I, I may, in that sense, I guess that would be considered an ORM in a type. ORM doesn't have the word database in it. So <laughs> true, true. I guess every time I do an as statement, then I'm I'm doing an ORM, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, no. uh, by the way, I'm not a fan of auto mapper, but let's not go into that. That's <laughs> a completely different subject. Um, but uh, yeah, the I think I think it'd be really cool to have a follow-up video, and I'm going to sort of do this to especially the people on here who who are passionate about things um, to take some of these, and I hope for this pattern for everyone in the future to be like, oh, here's some good things about this talk, and here's some things I disagree with because I'm a code first person, 
Um, mm -hmm. Of course, still being respectful. Obviously, Joel's talking about uh, the snares that he's used to, and uh, and you'd be talking about other people who are talking about the snares that they're used to, um, and say, "Well, I've seen Co first working like this, or I've seen definitely normalize everything in these scenarios." You know, and talk about those scenarios like anyone. I'd love to get more talks about that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kimberly, thank you for the link to your the YouTube videos about that. I'll definitely check that out. It looks good. Um, and also, I heard uh, kind of a funny anecdote. Uh, a lot of the things I talked about today and a lot of the things I hear when people talk about this, it's like minor traumas shape people's opinions. You're like, I had to stay up all night on this production issue, and so here's why I feel so strongly about this. So I feel like that could be a, a very interesting uh, talk is like the work traumas that create our like entrenched opinions. Uh, so... That would that would be fun, but yeah, yeah. Um, Philip, um, Philip in Texas, who's actually not in Texas, um, he has a he has a uh, little statement. He said, um, "Normalize tables, <clears throat> and then use views to flatten and denormalize them, uh, and then maybe consider a different ETL database for over denormalization." So, I, I I think it makes sense. I've I've seen some patterns, especially for you were talking about reporting a few different times here, um, such that. You have your uh, your bounded context context for your microservices, but there's also some ETL going where those going on where those are always sort of pushing into sort of a reporting database, and then you can run a lot of these things against reporting databases, and that's usually the scenario that I see where I have to give in, where I'm like, okay, let your thing over here just directly look at a database that you don't own. It's almost always for reporting. Um, and so in that case, having having like an ETL of these different data structures where you think it's important ETLing into um, a reporting database um, is it's a pattern that I've seen that sort of helps you justify bounded context. Um, or, you know, I control my data, you don't touch it. Um, yeah. But that's but I think he's talking mostly about normalization and denormalization. Uh, I think that's a good, I, I like that pattern, especially for BI tools. I think where it starts to get a little tricky is when you, if your model's changing often, now you may be changing how you're denormalizing. Um, and so you have like the uh, effectively like a, a caching problem where now you're, you're building another DB, but it's effectively a cache for some BI reporting tool. Uh, and now you're, you're having to manage two DBs instead of one. So if your schema is relatively strong, it's awesome because you can defer a lot of load to an actual like data database or a, sorry, a reporting database instead of using your primary application model database. But if your application is, is churning and iterating, then now you're doing a lot of rework just to push some execution cycles away from your actual like uh, data itself. So yeah. I, I think that's a really good tool for more stable domains. I don't think it's as good for we're in the startup world and we're not sure what we're going to do next year. So that's, that's where I spent a lot of my career. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a scary thing. The startup world, like the real startup world, like we're starting a business today, uh, is, it's really hard to, to say, I'm, we're going to do these principles, like any principles, anything that I come into when I come in the picture and like, we're going to mature your system. You can't really mature a system from day one because that's not how maturity works. Uh, right, because day two, you have to rewrite how your user auth works, right? <laughs> Kimberly uh, just, uh, yeah, Kimberly just uh, coined the term trauma-driven development. Yeah, I think that could be its own talk, uh, both serious <laughs> and lighthearted. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, yeah, if anyone else, else has any questions, go ahead and throw those into uh, the Techlahoma uh, Twitch and uh, otherwise actually on our Slack um, and again, if, you don't, if you're not in the Techlahoma Slack, you can go to slack.techlahoma.org. We'll probably be on this call for a little while longer. Uh, I may be shutting down the stream here, uh, but, yep, thank you, Kimberly. Um, but um, I'll be posting the link to this actual meet that I'm in. <laughs> it's been on the screen the whole time. I'm surprised no one has stream sniped us. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and put this link inside the Slack, and, uh, and then you guys can jump in the call and... Uh, Go ahead and chat with Joel and chat and ask him any questions that you want to ask him. You got any closing thank remarks you, or any other things, Joel? No, thank you guys for letting me uh, talk. I hope you had a little bit of fun on your lunch hour. Uh, and then, yeah, I'll send the references to the Slack channel because that'll probably be the easiest way to, to view them. Some good articles uh, in there, actually. So uh, I recommend you guys look at a few of them. But, yeah, thank you again. All right. Thank you, Joel.